All right, so yesterday we ended off and we had talked about how we write the proper names for simple binary ionic compounds. And we had talked about how ionic bonds are weak bonds that involve the trading of electrons between metals and nonmetals. Okay? And then we talked about the naming, which was we write the name of the metal, and then we write the name of the nonmetal, and it ends in ide, and we don't put prefixes on them, and all that good stuff. Okay? And then we did like four, or no, we do six at the end of class. Okay? So, I don't need us to do all the rest of these, so let's say we're going to do four more, just to review what we did yesterday. So we'll go to uh, number 10 here. So we'll go from 7 to 10. All right, have you guys write the names for those ionic compounds just as a quick review. And then we're going to move on to some stuff that we haven't done with ionic compounds before. All right, so for number seven here, okay, we've got our ionic compound, Na stands for? Sodium. sodium. Okay, and O stands for? Oxygen, but we'll change its ending to? I. Okay, so that stuff would just be sodium oxide. And we don't need a prefix there because it's ionic. This is the only way that sodium and oxygen can go together because Oxygen is a negative two charge, as are all the things in group 16, okay? Um, and sodium is a plus one charge, as are all the things in group one, okay? All right, for number eight, BA stands for? Yeah, uh, barium, actually. Yeah. Okay, um, and SE stands for? Selenium. There's two ways you can write this. Okay, I read it this way, selenide, because it's shorter, okay? But you could also write it selenamide. Either one would be acceptable, okay, as the correct way to write the name of that. So barium selenide or barium selenamide. Either way, it ends in ide, okay, and it's good. Okay, for number nine, RA stands for radium. And TE stands for tellurium, so that would be tellurite. Okay. And number 10, what does LI stand for? Lithium. And F stands for fluorine. Making sense, to everybody? Okay, that should hopefully all be familiar from Science Nine. Okay, now let me ask you this hypothetical question: Or not? Okay. Okay, copper is what we call a transition metal. Okay? That means it's in the middle of the periodic table. Okay? And in the middle of the periodic table, lots of the metals have more than one possible charge. Okay? Uh, so for example, like iron can be a three plus or a two plus. Copper can be a two plus or a one plus, which means both of those compounds can exist. Would they have different properties? Definitely. Okay. They could definitely have very different properties because one of them only has one copper and one oxygen, the other has two coppers and one oxygen. And it's the number of particles that gives a compound its physical and chemical properties. Does anyone see a problem with having two things that look like that that would have different properties? The way to write it. The way to write it. Because right now, if I follow the rules for naming, these two things have the same what? They have the same name, right? If I follow the ionic compound naming rules, 
Both of these compounds are copper oxide. Is that a problem? Definitely a problem. Okay, it's the same problem I had about eight years ago when I had two Chase William Andersons in the same class. I kid you not. Okay, and boy, they could not have been two more different people. Okay, but they had the same name. I sure hope I didn't screw anything up along the way in that class because how do I know? I had to actually tell them, you're number one and you're number two, which I hope didn't like, you know, affect their, their you know, ego or anything like that, that one was number one and one was number two. But how else was I supposed to tell them apart? They had the same damn name. Even the middle name was the same. Okay? Well, they were two different people. I can't have two different compounds with the same name. I mean, what if this one's really good for you and this one's poisonous? Right? You're, you're you know, making a, a, vitamin, a new vitamin for people and you put the wrong one in and everybody dies. That's kind of a big deal. Okay? These two things cannot have the same name. So, we have to indicate somehow within the name that this copper oxide contains the copper with a 1 plus and this copper oxide contains the copper with the 2 plus because they are going to be different compounds, different molecules. Okay? So the way we do that is we use a Roman numeral to tell people which copper it is. And so, what that would look like is this. Um, oxygen always has a minus two charge, okay? According to what we know about ionic compounds, a compound or a molecule has to have its charges balanced. That is, they have to add up to zero, yes? Okay, so which copper is in that compound? The 1 plus or the 2 plus? The 2. The 2, okay? Because there's one oxygen and one copper. And the oxygen, we already know, has a negative 2 charge. The only way this compound ends up having a charge, an overall charge of 0, is if this is the copper that's 2 plus. Okay? So then, when I write the name of this stuff, it would be copper 2, so a little subscript Roman numeral 2, okay, oxide. Right, and we would do a similar thing with the other one. Oxygen is always a minus two. We always look to the non-metal because there are no non-metals with more than one possible charge. Okay? Oxygen is always a minus two, and there's one of it, but there are two coppers. So the only way this compound ends up having a charge of zero is if these are the coppers that have a charge of one. Okay? Because one times two is positive two, and this would be negative two, and it would add up to zero. All right, so now this stuff would be copper one oxide. Okay. So we have to put a Roman numeral in, and we have to figure out which Roman numeral to put in there. All right, and that's how we do it. We kind of it's almost like reversing the drop and swap. We don't want to always rely on that because it's not always going to work, but it's kind of like that. Okay, I just look at what the charge is here, then I know how many positives I need to have, and I can figure out what each one has from there. All right, everybody okay with that idea? Okay. All right, so multivalent metals, or the transition metals, the ones in the middle, okay, have several possible charges because they give up different numbers of electrons. Okay? Um, and that has to be shown when we're writing their names. So to do that, we use a Roman numeral to denote which form of the metal was used, like copper to sulfate, or in the case of this compound here, iron to oxide. Okay. Now, how did I know in that compound to use the two? From the oxygen, right? Okay, oxygen is always a negative two, and there's the same number of iron atoms and oxygen atoms, so we must have the same charge. Okay, what if I have this one?
Okay, I know this is going to be iron something oxide. Okay, it's an ionic compound. Write the name of the metal, write the name of the non-metal, but I gotta put a Roman numeral in there and I gotta figure out which one. Okay, this is about as tricky as they get. What's the charge on oxygen always? Negative two. Okay, how many oxygens are there? Three. So how many negative charges do I have in total in this compound? Six. Okay, if every oxygen is negative two and there are three oxygens, then I have six negative charges. So if I want this compound to have an overall charge of zero, I've got to get six positive charges out of the two irons that I have. So what does each iron have to have a charge of then? Three. How'd you do that? Because there's two irons, I can do three plus three is six. Yeah. Six divided by two is three. Okay. So there's a little bit of method there, but like a little bit of math, we'll say, but it's not hard math. Like you had to divide two numbers. Yeah, you guys can handle that, no problem. Okay, so um, this then is going to be the iron with the Roman numeral three. Okay, now, how many people know their Roman numerals? Okay, not too many. That's why the Roman Empire failed. It was a stupid numbering system. Okay, it's not really, but um, so here's the numbers, just so you know. They, they actually make sense for a while. That's one. I. I is one. That's two. That's three. This is where it starts to break down. Okay. IV is four. Because it's one less than five. That's five. Okay. So one, two, three. Four, five. So what would six look like? Bi. Bi, right. Realistically, you're never going to have to go higher than four, okay? Um, but like, there's the odd thing that has a five or a seven, okay? but it's pretty rare. Most of the time, if you know one to four, you're pretty good there. Okay? So you know, if you watch movies, sequels often use Roman numerals. The Rocky movies, the Star Wars movies, they you know, use Roman numerals. Okay? Okay, questions on how that works? It just takes a bit of practice, but I mean, like I say, it's nothing terribly complex. You have to do a little bit of multiplication and division, okay? but other than that, uh, nothing too, too scary. Okay. So, we already did this one. So, try two, three, and four. So I'm going to start out doing this just like I would a normal ionic compound, okay? And I would write that this is cobalt sulfide, okay? But now, now that we know that there are some ionic compounds that need Roman numerals, we can't trust any of them. We have to check them all to see whether they need them or not, okay? How do I know if it needs a Roman numeral? Where do I look? I look right here. Okay, I look up the metal. And if the metal has more than one possible charge, then I know I need to figure out which Roman numeral it needs. Okay, if this was calcium sulfide, I, would, I wouldn't need to worry about a Roman numeral. Calcium can only be a two, so I don't need to bother with one. Okay, but this does have more than one possible charge, so it does need a Roman numeral. 
Okay, so what I do then is I look to the non-metal. Sulfur always has a minus two charge because it's in group 16 along with oxygen. Okay, where everything has a minus two charge. Did we go over that the other day? Yeah, okay. All right, so sulfur has a minus two charge and it's, there's one sulfur and one cobalt in here, which means they have to have the same what? Same charge, one positive, one negative, but the same number, right? Okay. That's the way, the only way that they'll balance out and add up to zero, right? So this is the cobalt with the two plus charge. So it gets a Roman numeral two. Okay. How many people have done the third one? All right, I'll give you a couple more minutes to do three and four, and then we'll have a look at those. Okay, so on this one here, we've got MN, which stands for manganese. Okay, and it's with chlorine. So it's going to be manganese something chloride. All right, now manganese has more than one possible charge. It can be a two or a four, I think, right? Yeah, two or four. Okay, so if I want to figure out whether this is the 2 plus manganese or 4 plus manganese, I've got to look to chlorine. What's the charge on chlorine? Negative 1. Negative 1. How many chlorines are there? 4. 4. So that means there are 4 negative charges in total on the right side of this. So I need to get 4 positive charges out of 1 manganese atom. So what's the charge on it then? There's only one manganese to get them from, so it has to come from all of it has all four have to come from that single one. So this is manganese IV chloride. Alright. Okay, and then for this one here, CU stands for copper. And S stands for sulfur, so this is copper something sulfide. Okay, copper can be a one plus or a two plus. What's sulfur always? Negative two. Okay, since there's only one sulfur and there's only one copper, they must have the same charge, okay? because I've got to get two positive charges from that one copper. So this is copper two sulfide. Okay. All right, why don't you try the next four there?
Okay, let's look at five and six here. So for number five, SN stands for 10, okay? And TE stands for tellurium, so this can be 10 something telluride, okay? And the possible charges for 10 are what, two and four? Two and four. Okay, so I've got to figure out which one it is. Well, tellurium is in uh, group 16, so it's got a charge of negative two. Okay, and there are two telluriums, so two times negative two is negative four. So that means I've got to get positive four from this single tin atom, so that means its charge has to be four. Okay, so this is tin. for Telluride. Okay. And then for number six, HG stands for mercury. Okay. And it is with astatine. That'll be acetide. Right. And mercury, uh, that, now. mercury can be a one or a two. All right. Um, so, it can be a 1 or a 2. Astatine is always a negative 1. So that means I've got two negative charges. So I've got to get two positive charges from one mercury. So this is mercury 2. That's the type. Why do some of the elements have symbols that don't make sense? Why is mercury HG and tin SN and tungsten W? Sodium is NA and lead is PB. There's all these ones that don't make any sense. Anybody know why? They're actually from their Latin names. Okay, um, so like uh, mercury is like hydrin, hydro argentium, so like liquid silver, quicksilver. Okay, uh, tungsten is wolfram, or W. Okay, things like that. Uh, lead is plombum. Okay, so PD. So if you're ever wondering why they have weird symbols, okay, it's because they they come from a Latin name. All right, how many people have done seven and eight? Okay, let's have a look at those then too. Okay, so for seven and eight, okay, we've got uh, for number seven, we've got PO, which is polonium. Okay, and we've got iodine, so polonium. Iodide, okay, and polonium can be a uh, three or a four. Uh, two or a four. Okay, so it can be a two or a four. Well, looking at this one, I'd say it's probably a four, simply because iodine's a negative one, and that would give me four negative charges, so I gotta get four charges out of that one polonium, so IV. Okay, and then for number eight, okay, SB is uh, antimony. And S is sulfur, so antimony something sulfide. Okay, and antimony can be a three or a five, I believe. Okay, so um, we got negative two, and there are three sulfurs, so negative two times three is negative six. So I gotta get six positives from two antimonies, so six divided by two. This is positive three. One, two, three. Okay. Are you good with those? So like I said, you gotta do a little bit of math. Okay, it's not hard math. You gotta multiply and you gotta divide. Okay, it's all single digit numbers. Nothing too terrible. All right, that's one of the new things with ionic compounds. Here's something else that can happen with ionic compounds that you probably did not do in Science 9. Um, what would that be called? Or let's say this, how many elements are in that compound? Three. All the other ones we've done have only had two. Okay, so this is still a binary ionic compound. It still only has two parts, even if it has three different elements in it. 
Okay? It, this is what we call um, an ionic compound that contains a polyatomic ion. Poly meaning many, ions meaning okay, charged particles, so this has many charged particles. Right? So what we have to do is we have to look at our table of polyatomic ions at the top of our periodic table. So if we have a metal and then we have more than one thing after that, the other thing will be in here. All right? So if I look for OH in here, I find it right here. The name for OH is hydroxide. So all I have to do is take that name and put it beside sodium. Okay? This stuff would be... Sodium hydroxide. Okay. Um, what would that stuff be? So the only thing that changes for these is we don't make them end in I, right? Because then they would be confusing because this would be lithium nitride, but that's not what lithium nitride looks like, okay? This has got a polyatomic ion. We do not change the endings of the polyatomic ions. We just write them exactly as they appear in the table, and that's it. So they're actually easier, okay? We just have to look up the name and write it down. And again, they're ionic, so we don't have to worry about any prefixes or anything like that. It's just the name of the nonmetal, okay, sorry, name of the metal, and the name of the polyatomic ion. Okay? Now, almost all of the polyatomic ions in that table have negative charges, except one. Okay? There is one ion in here that has a positive charge, and that is ammonium. Okay, so is it going to behave like a metal or a non-metal? It's going to behave like a metal. Okay, so anytime you have a compound that has ammonium in it, okay, ammonium will get written first. Okay, so that stuff would be called ammonium chloride. Okay. We just name it like any other ionic compound. It's acting as a metal, so I write its name unchanged, just like I do with any other metal. Okay. That would be ammonium chloride. Okay. All right, so that's polyatomic ions. They're really not too tricky as long as you learn the names. Okay, so, um, all right, let's take a little break. Okay, give you about five minutes within the classroom here, and then we'll talk about some molecular. Right, so we've kind of gone over all the things that can happen with ionic compounds, okay, at least in terms of writing their names. We haven't really talked about writing their formulas yet, okay, but we'll get to that. What we want to talk about now are molecular compounds, some of the properties of a molecular bond, okay, or what we call a covalent bond, and how to do the naming for those, which is actually fairly straightforward, and there aren't any like special rules or exceptions like there were uh, with the ionic compounds. Okay, so molecular compounds arise when two or more non-metals react, okay, and form a new compound. Right? And we're only going to deal with binary ones, so it's just going to be two. Okay? Um, now, non-metals all have negative charges. So this idea that we can balance charges doesn't work for a molecular compound. But it also doesn't have to. Molecular compounds, the, the non-metals that are in them, aren't looking to trade electrons. They're looking to share them. So what they end up doing is still having their outer shell full, like we looked at with the ionic compounds, but they don't do it by giving and taking. They do it by sharing an electron. Okay? Um, so the bond is much, much stronger because they can't have their outer shell full unless they stay with the other non-metal. 
right? So these covalent bonds are far stronger than the ionic bonds that are the result of, here's my electron, go ahead, okay? Um, whereas these ones are, well, here, we'll share it, okay? It's like, you know, the last piece of pizza, okay? We'll share the last piece of pizza, or here's the last piece of pizza, okay? It's, it, it works differently. They have to stay really strongly bonded together so that they continue to be happy okay, and have that, sh that full outer shell of electrons, okay? Um, so, if we're looking at water, for example, okay, water is a molecular compound, right? It can also be considered an ionic, it's kind of weird that way, okay? But um, it does have a molecular or a covalent bond where the electrons are shared. So, hydrogen, okay, wants to have a full outer shell. Its only shell can hold two electrons. So when it's sharing its electron with oxygen, that's filling one of the two empty spots in oxygen's outer shell, and the one that oxygen is sharing is filling the other empty spot in hydrogen's outer shell. So they're both happy. They're both getting that outer shell full, okay? And that happens with the other hydrogen as well, because obviously it's H2O, okay? Oxygen needs two hydrogens because it needs two electrons, and they can only give, they can only share one because that's all they have. Okay? Everyone okay with that? All right. Now, that sharing isn't always equal. All right. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about kind of the strange properties that water has. Okay. But water doesn't actually share the electrons equally. The electrons from hydrogen actually end up spending way more time over by the oxygen than they do by the hydrogen because oxygen holds on to electrons more strongly. So it's not all hunky-dory. Okay? Like they don't share it equally and they're all just blissfully happy. Okay? But the oxygen actually has the electron a lot more than the hydrogen does. And that's what makes water do all kinds of weird things like expand when it freezes. Like Water is one of very few things that does that, okay? Or, um, you know, that kind of beads and runs off of things or can stick to the side of a glass and not fall down, okay? Water does these, these strange things and that's because of these bonds, okay? All right, so all you really need to know about the molecular compound or the covalent bond is that it's strong and it's the result of sharing the electrons, okay? If you know that, you're good on the structure of a covalent bond. All right, so as we said, molecular compounds arise when two or more nonmetals react and form a new substance, okay? The electrons are shared, and so in the naming, we have to use prefixes because it's not, there's not a fixed ratio of, you know, like nitrogen to oxygen. Nitrogen and oxygen can go together in a variety of different ratios as long as they're whole numbers, okay? Um, because they're not trading the electrons and balancing charges, they're sharing them. Okay? And so that's why we have to have the prefixes in a molecular compound. So you'll see the dyes and tries and all of that stuff in the names for molecular compounds. So the naming goes pretty much the same. We name them from left to right. So if I had CS2, that would be carbon disulfide. So I name the first thing carbon first, and then I name the second one second. Okay? And I put in any prefixes that are necessary. Okay? For this one here, um, this actually would is not right. What's missing in that one? They didn't put a prefix on the oxygen in that name. It should be dinitrogen monoxide, mono indicating one. Okay? All right, so for the prefixes, okay, we need to know our prefixes up to 10. Okay, so you might want to write these down somewhere. Oh, 
Okay, so those uh, prefixes are something you're going to have to memorize at some point. Okay, but they do go along with geometry. Okay, um, so like a triangle, a tetrahedron, a pentagon, a hexagon, a heptagon, octagon, octagon. Okay, um, so just so you know, they, they, it's the same prefix. Okay. okay, everybody good with those? Okay, so writing the names for molecular compounds is pretty straightforward. We just need to know the names. The second nonmetal does still need to end in ide. Okay, so we don't alter the first one, but we do alter the second one. One last weird rule, just because chemists have to be difficult. What's the one prefix that never goes on the first one? Mono. mono. Yeah, you never put mono on the first one. Okay, so if I had this compound, for example, Okay. I wouldn't write monocarbon tetrahydride. It's just carbon tetrahydride. Okay. Don't ask me why. Chemists just have to be difficult. Okay. So they got this weird rule okay, where mono never goes on the first one, but all the others could. All right. Let's have you guys try the first four there. So for our first one here, okay, obviously it's a molecular compound because they're both non-metals. So I would write the first non-metal with its name unaltered, so nitrogen. And then um, I would need to put a prefix on the iodine. What prefix am I putting on there? Tri. tri. So this would be nitrogen tri-iodide. Okay? And I wouldn't mark this wrong, but I suppose technically there should be a hyphen there. Okay? Um, but I don't teach English. I think there's supposed to be a hyphen in the fields, right? Okay. Um, then for number two, okay, uh, again, both non-metals. So there's no prefix on the first one because there's only one. Okay, so we got carbon, and then what prefix goes on the iodine? Tetra. Okay, so that would be carbon tetra iodide. All right, in the third one, do I need prefixes on both? Yes. yes. Okay, so this is going to be dinitrogen trioxide. Okay. And then our last one will be tellurium. practice quiz last night. Okay, was it worth your while? Yes. Was it pretty much the same? I think I changed like one thing. No, I don't think no. you changed anything. Okay, so it was exactly the same. I couldn't remember if I changed the thing about the, the proton and the electron, but I had is who discovered the electron on both. Okay. All right, so sometimes that happens. I'm not going to say it always happens because it doesn't, but sometimes it does. Okay, it, even if it doesn't, it's still worth doing the practice quiz because I'm going to ask similar things. Okay. Um, all right, we got 125 or so we got time. Let's do four more and then we'll call it a day. Okay, so just real quick checking our answers here. Okay, this one here would be diphosphorus trisulfide. Okay, this one here would be oxygen monosulfide. Okay, we would have trisilicone tetraphosphide. And we would have sulfur dichloride. All right, so tomorrow we'll spend some time just kind of practicing and working on naming. Yeah, I'll throw some. I mean, this is a bit artificial because you know they're all molecular. Okay? And before you knew they were all ionic or you knew they all needed Roman numerals. I'm going to throw some that are just random. Okay? And you've got to identify so that's a little more realistic. Okay? That's what we'll be looking at tomorrow. And then next week we'll start looking at lab reports and our first lab. Okay? That's kind of where we're headed to.